Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 67 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for August 12th, uh, August 2nd, rather, to 8th, 2012. I'm your host. My name's Larry Erickson. And for about the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me, I think, deserve your attention. Um, hope you missed us last week. We had some technical difficulties, but we're back now. And I'm just going to be here every week from now on. Um, as always, if you see the show and you have any comments, questions, reactions, if you have any tidbits or things you want to pass on, by all means, please do. You not only can, you should contact me directly. Uh, my email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which I always figure you never do on the fly like that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be around here a couple of times during the show. Go there and um, you can uh, get the email address di uh, directly from there. Uh, as always, I do answer my email. Uh, I am a little bit slow about it, but I do answer it. Uh, I just really do ask that if you email me, you please include something in the subject line, like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that, so that I know it's not spam and dump it without meaning to. Um, Okay, with all of that um, usual stuff out of the way, uh, I'm going to get to what we're going to talk about today. And the first thing we're going to is our regular feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, and this week, there's actually, there is a whole bunch of outrages all mixed together in this one thing. So uh, this is going to be a biggie. I'm going to start with something you already know about. You already know this. On Friday, July 20th, 24-year-old James Holmes went into a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado and started shooting people. When it was over, 12 people were dead, 58 more were injured, most of them by being shot. So there's the first outrage involved here. Just the fact that this happened, this incident itself, this murderous rampage is itself a moral outrage. The thing is, though, when he went on his rampage, Holmes was wearing a ballistic helmet, a gas mask, a throat protector, a tactical vest, and tactical pants. In fact, he was so well fitted out with protective clothing that when the cops first got there, they almost thought he was part of their SWAT team. He threw tear gas into the crowd before he started shooting. He was armed with two handguns and an AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle modified with a high-powered 100-round drum magazine. Holmes also had a shotgun. He left that in his car. He had amassed 6,000 rounds of ammunition, including 300 shells for his shotgun. And everything... Everything, every bit of that arsenal, the ammunition, the guns, the clothing, the tear gas, all of it, he got entirely legally. Entirely legally. Uh, and not only legally, it didn't even raise any red flags anywhere. As one writer put it, I'm quoting here, an unregulated online marketplace allows consumers to acquire some of the tools of modern warfare as if they were pieces of a new wardrobe which raises the second outrage here, which is, what are we going to do about this? Nothing. We are not going to do a damn thing. No, in fact, the, the AR-15 that he had and the 100-round magazine were both illegal under the, um, the uh, assault weapons ban that was passed in 1994. But that law expired in 2004, and then, and any time since then, no one has really raised a finger to try to renew it. And it's not going to be re-raised now. We're not going to do anything about this. Oh, President Hopi Changey, he went on about how saddened he was by the event. Witless Romney joined right in with that. And the, the House... The House of Representatives even adopted a resolution honoring the victims of the massacre. Isn't that precious? But none of these people, not one of them, is going to do a single damn thing to actually try to see to it that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. In 2007, we had the Virginia Tech massacre. 12 dead. Uh, 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 32 dead, rather. 32 dead, 12 injured. Nothing was done. In 2011, we had Gabrielle Giffords uh, her shot, being shot in Tucson. Six dead, 13 injured. Nothing was done. 
Now we have Aurora. And again, nothing will be done. In his first official response to this massacre, Obama emphasized how he intends to safeguard the Second Amendment as if it was really under some kind of threat. He prays, I'm quoting him, the traditions of gun ownership that passed on from generation to generation because this was part of a cherished national heritage. The White House later added that Obama will seek to work within existing law. In other words, he's not going to do a single thing. Meanwhile, House Speaker John Boner, he said, oh, I agree with the president. I absolutely agree with the president. No new laws. Don't do anything about this. No laws. No new laws. The thing is, what makes this even worse is that this is not just Aurora. It's not, it's not, I mean, that's the kind of thing that gets our attention, that maybe gets us thinking about this for a little while. But the fact is, the United States sees an average of two auroras every single day of every single year. About 9,000 people are killed every year in the United States by guns. And that doesn't count accidents or suicides. And those and the figure is up to 25,000 gun deaths a year, every year. That means, that figure means that the United States accounts for over 80% of all of the gun deaths in the 23 richest nations of the world combined. But actually do something to stop this carnage? Actually do something to limit the amount of sheer firepower out there that kills the equivalent of the entire population of Carver every six months. Oh no, we can't do that. No, no. Because, apparently, 9,000 dead and 16,000 more dead is part of a cherished national heritage. We all know the reason the real reason for this can't-do attitude is spelled N-R-A and actually has far more to do with political cowardice than it does with any heritage except a heritage of political cowardice. I mean, that cowardice, by the way, I, you got to no, no, realize this is not limited to the federal level. Absolutely not. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, who's, who's uh, he's a Democrat, by the way, and yes, that's his actual name, uh, he dodged a question about gun control. He said of Holmes, quoting, even if he didn't have access to guns, this guy was diabolical. He would have found explosives. He would have found something. Yeah, right. Maybe if he didn't have access to all these guns and all this protective gear and tear gas and all the rest of this, he would have gone into that theater and, I don't know, thrown lawn furniture at people. Maybe, maybe it would have been a case of, oh my gosh, look out, he's got a backpack full of frisbees and he's not afraid to use them. Meanwhile, Colorado State Senator, uh, State Representative rather, name is Mark Waller, he cautioned against any attempts to uh, limit purchases of ammunition. And by the way, other than hollow-headed and armor-piercing bullets, the purchase of ammunition is basically totally unregulated in the United States. But he warned against any possibility of, uh, of uh, regulating ammunition. In fact, he said those 300 shotgun rounds, he said, ah, I do that all the time. That's everyday stuff. And the mayor of Aurora, who you would think would be concerned about this, he was actually appearing with Hickenlooper, and he contented himself with saying of Holmes, there was something wrong with this individual, duh. And he ignored the weapons involved entirely. Now, in fairness, I have to say, I have to note that not every, uh, uh, not every voice was one of cowardice. Former Pennsylvania Governor Ed, I'm not really a progressive, but I play one on MSNBC, Randall, uh, Rendell, rather, I'm sorry is his name, uh, Ed Rendell, he said, everyone is scared of the NRA, but went on to say, there are some things worth losing for in politics, and to be able to prevent carnage like this is worth losing for. 
And New York City Mayor Michael, I'm um, just an average everyday billionaire tool of Wall Street, Bloomberg, said, quoting again, soothing words are nice, but maybe it's time that the two people who want to be president of the United States stand up and tell us what they are going to do about it. Unfortunately, Mr. Mayor, we already know the answer to that question. They're not going to do a damn thing. Now, in the future, I'm going to be talking more about this. I'm going to be talking more about the politics of guns, about the influence of the NRA, about the influence of campaign financing and secret campaign financing. I'm also going to be talking about our gun culture. This was something is aptly summarized unintentionally by one Dudley Brown. He's the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. And he said in the wake of the shootings that Holmes' collections of guns, uh, two handguns, uh, an assault rifle, and a shotgun, were the average male in Colorado. And he also said, quoting him, if I had only 6,000 rounds for my AR-15s, I'd literally feel naked. Which is a statement I think that is actually more revealing than he intended it to be. So yes, I will be looking at why, the question of why, we are so much more violent than other nations. Those reasons include the hundreds of millions of guns that are out there. But they actually go beyond that. And at some point, I will be talking about that. But right now, I want to address something else. I want to address the despicable, inhuman, subhuman responses from the wackos and wingnuts that make up the right half of the American political spectrum. Now, the fact that they respond to every such bloodbath in the same way makes the responses no less despicable. There was, for example, Sarah Phelan. She inanely blathered on about how the bad guys don't follow laws and restricting more of America's freedoms when it comes to self-defense isn't the answer. Because, again, bad guys don't follow laws. Yeah, well, maybe they don't. Uh, it may well be true. On the other hand, maybe the people who run the gun shops and the people who sell at these gun shows and so on and the rest of those who supply the weapons to the bad guys, maybe they would follow the law. Then there are always those who are ready to blame the victims, such as uh, former Arizona, Arizona State Senator Russell Pierce. He's best known as the author of the state's infamous Papers, Please law. The day after the tragedy, he wondered online why no one was brave enough to stop it. Where were the men of Flight 93, he bloviated. All that was needed was for one courageous, and I assume he meant courageous, but uh, all that was needed was for one courageous man prepared mentally or otherwise to stop this. It could have been done. Now, after the Arizona Republic and the Phoenix New Times reported his remarks, Pierce got all huffy and insisted he was being mischaracterized. Oh, he wasn't blaming the victims. Oh, no. Perish the thought, even though that's exactly what he'd just done. No, he insisted he was actually blaming gun control. Yes, he was blaming gun control for, uh, for um, Holmes having all of these weapons because that left so many people disarmed and vulnerable when he said the only real effect is to disarm everyone who could have saved lives. Now, that was echoed by Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson. He said the slaughter proved, I'm quoting him here, one of the rationales behind conceal and carry, where criminals actually have to be concerned that somebody could stop them. That somebody, a responsible individual carrying a weapon, maybe they could have prevented the deaths and injuries. So what's the argument here? What are these people saying? They are saying that there aren't enough guns out there. There aren't enough people walking around carrying concealed, loaded weapons. Because, by God, if there had been a bunch of people in that theater packing heat, then amid the darkness of the theater and the tear gas and the smoke, so thick that one survivor said he could only see Holmes as a silhouette, amid the noise and the people running and screaming, amid the tumult and the chaos, that if only other people had also been shooting off guns so that no one even knew who the original shooter was, all trying to hit a target who was wearing protective gear. Oh yeah, you Farina for brains jackasses. Oh yeah, that would have made everything fine. 
And of course, we have the conspiracy nuts, like talk radio guy Alex Jones. Now, if you don't know who Alex Jones is, consider yourself lucky. Uh, it's estimated that listening to a half hour of Alex Jones will kill more brain cells than the entire 60s did. He claims that the Aurora Theater shooting was a staged event designed to generate support for taking away our guns, leaving us vulnerable to the new world order. Black helicopters optional. According to Jones, the person who did the shooting was actually some black op masked operator, and Holmes was just a patsy who was drugged with amnesiacs and duped into taking the fall. Who it was that received the dozens of shipments of ammunition, ammunition, body armor, and explosives that were delivered to Holmes' apartment and to his place at the school, that goes unexplained. And finally, finally we come to the religious fanatics of the right. Because uh, they know. God has told them. They know who's responsible for this. There is no question who is responsible for this kind of massacre. And the answer is liberalism and secularism. Fred Jackson, he's head of the American Family Association, which is listed as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. He blamed Hollywood movies, what we see on the internets, you know, just how many internets do these people think there actually are? But what we see on the internets, uh, liberal bias in the media, he blamed, politicians changing public policy, and churches leaving the authority of scripture. Jerry Newcomb, he's a, a representative for Truth in Action Ministries, he blamed the shooting on the separation of church and state. Apparently, he thinks this is a brand new thing. That separation, he said, has chased away any fear of God in the hearts of millions. And in case you didn't get what he meant about the fear of God part, he also said that those among the dead who were really, really, really Christian, well, their death wasn't so tragic because they're going to a wonderful place. But if you weren't really, really, really Christian, then <laughs> you went straight to hell. Now, the truth is, if I believed in hell, I'd have to believe that there would be a special place in it for despicable scum like Fred Jackson and Jerry Newcomb. Right there along with the right-wing wackos and the whole mass of political cowards who mouth platitudes that turn to dust in the air because they're actually more concerned with kissing the butt of the NRA than the end with, they are with protecting the lives and safety of their constituents. Again, I will have more to say about this at some point. But right now, I just have to say, this is an outrage. And we will take a break. And we're back. And uh, after that, um, I'm uh, going to need some good news. going to need some good news. So here's some good news for you. The government of Scotland has announced plans to legalize same-sex marriage. Uh, Deputy First Minister, her name is Nicola Sturgeon, said last week that legislation to this end will soon be introduced. And it's sure to pass because it has the support of all the major Scottish political parties. Scotland would thus uh, would become the uh, first part of the United Kingdom to legalize same-sex marriage. Now, the, the national government, the UK government, has conducted what they call a public consultation. This is where like, they ask for public comments and public input on stuff. But they've had this public consultation on same-sex marriages. But officials say they're waiting to see the results of this before they take any further action. In other words, they're waiting to see if it's politically safe or not. But considering that uh, recognition, uh, recognizing same-sex marriages has been endorsed by Prime Minister David Cameron, eh, the position can't be too far out there. But here's the real surprise on this. Vietnam is considering recognizing same-sex marriages. Now, Vietnam is hardly a bastion of human rights. And in fact, until just a few years ago, homosexuality was labeled a social evil alongside drug addiction and prostitution. 
Uh, now, it's unclear what form such recognition would take or even if the idea will survive the debates that are going to happen about it. And, uh, but the very fact that it's being considered is a major step forward. In fact, Justice Minister, his name is Ha Hong Chuang, he described it as facing reality. Now, the thing is, if it does come to pass, Vietnam will become the first nation in Asia to do this. Now, here at home, there is also some interesting news on this front, which has really to do with changing public attitudes. Um, among those who, who follow the issue, uh, the Chick-fil-A fast food chain, which I always want to call Chick-fil-A, which seems a more natural way to say it, but, uh, but uh, Chick-fil-A, yes, the Chick-fil-A uh, fast food chain has long been known uh, for its anti-same-sex marriage attitudes. Uh, in fact, it has contributed millions of dollars to organizations who work to prevent same-sex marriage. But something happened recently that brought attention to the company. Uh, a few weeks ago, Chick-fil-A president Dan Cathy, he was asked about those reports of the company's anti-gay stance, and he answered, well, guilty as charged. That flip response, along with his insistence that, quoting him, we are very much supportive of the family, the biblical definition of the family, that struck a nerve and there were calls to boycott the chain. Now, those calls were countered by folks like Mike Huckleberry, uh, Rick I Should Be in a Sanitarium, and Sarah Phelan, among others. Uh, they urged people to eat more Chick-fil-A. In fact, there was a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. All right, so what's happened? Okay, YouGov is a polling organization, and among the things that they track on behalf of their clients are the approval scores for members of the top national quick service restaurant sector. In other words, the leading fast food chains. And they track approval ratings for these companies. Now, just before this interview was published, Chick-fil-A's index score was 65, which was well above the industry average of 46. Just four days later, it was down to 47, and last week, Chick-fil-A's score was down to 39, which is actually now compared to the sector average of 43. So the fact is, if you celebrate your uh, opposition to equal rights for same-sex couples, yes, your customers do care, and that is good news. All right, and now, uh, moving on again to our, uh, one of our uh, regular features, the Clarabelle Award. This is given on a regular basis for acts of meritorious stupidity. This time the dishonoree is U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Arizona, one Judge James A. Teilborg. Back in April, Arizona Gov Governor Jan Brewery signed a bill that would ban abortions after 20 weeks, except in narrow cases where the life of the mother is at risk. It was to go into effect this past Thursday, August 2nd. Now, the ACLU went to court, went to federal court, on behalf of three Arizona physicians who sought a temporary injunction against the law going into effect uh, pending the outcome of their legal challenge to it. Now, their argument was simple. The controlling legal opinion on this, the controlling case on this, was a 1992 Supreme Court decision known as Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Uh, the court found in that, in that ruling, they said that states cannot ban abortions prior to viability. That is, prior to the time the fetus could survive outside the womb, which is now considered usually around 23 or 24 weeks, which would appear to make this a slam dunk case. Unfortunately, it was heard before Judge Teilborg, who in effect told those doctors in the ACLU that resistance is futile. In the course of the hearing, he actually lectured the lead counsel for the plaintiffs, that is the ACLU attorney, on her supposed lack of compassion for the unborn child. He suggested that that supposed lack of compassion underscores the legitimacy, he said, of the state's action. Now, Given that patent bias in favor of a fantasy, cause, well, because I've said any number of times, there's no such thing as an unborn child. There, there isn't. If it's not born, it's not a child. Unless you're going to start referring to a caterpillar as an unborn butterfly, a tadpole as an unborn frog, and an acorn as an unborn oak tree, then no, you cannot be referring to an unborn child. 
But considering that bias in favor of a fantasy, it should come as no surprise that Teilborg denied the injunction and allowed the law to go into effect. But here's the thing which could come as a surprise, although perhaps it shouldn't be. He also declared that the hearing actually was not about the injunction. It was a hearing on the merits of the law, and so he threw the suit out entirely. His reasoning? Based on the provision regarding saving the life of the mother, the law doesn't actually ban abortions after 20 weeks. It merely restricts them. Quoting him, the law is not a ban on pre-viability abortions, but is rather a limit on some pre-viability abortions between 20 weeks gestational age and viability. Now, you know that there is a law against shooting people in the streets. But if you were to shoot somebody who was in the course of, say, actively trying to kill you with a knife, you probably wouldn't be prosecuted for that. So by Judge Teilborg's logic, that law actually does not ban shooting people in the streets. It merely restricts some cases of it. And or another example, you know, there, there's a law against you can't go through a red light. Can't go through a red light. Uh, but if you were to go through a red light while you were rushing somebody to the emergency room because you thought they were having a heart attack, as I did once with my father, I really think you probably would not get a ticket for that. So, according to him, that law does not ban going through red lights. It merely puts a limitation on some cases of it. Now, the ACLU is making an emergency appeal of the decision to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, calling Tileborg's Ty ruling uh, wrong on its face. Which is not surprising, since Jud Judge Tileborg's own face has a great big red nose on it. James Tileborg, clown. All right, last thing. I got about two minutes. I think I'm going to try to get some of this very quickly. Um, I've talked before about voter ID laws, voter ID laws, um, which people say that uh, well, they're supposed to. Con they're supposed to. You know, I say that these laws are designed to prevent certain groups of people from being able to vote. Particularly, people are more likely to vote a liberal way. Uh, uh, but the but the advocates say, oh, voter fraud. Don't you care about voter fraud? Well, Pennsylvania is one of these states with one of these insane laws. There's a suit now against it. Um, and, he, and before the hearing started, in a stipulation with the plaintiffs, the state of Pennsylvania acknowledged that there has been no investigation or prosecution of in-person voter fraud in Pennsylvania. The parties don't have knowledge of any such investigations in other states. And Pennsylvania won't offer any evidence that there has been any in-person voter fraud in Pennsylvania. So before the hearing started, Pennsylvania admitted that the entire basis of the law is bogus. Bogus. Do not forget that. I'll talk more about that next week, but for right now, i got to get out of here. You have the best week you possibly can, and we will see you next week.